Dr. Howard C. E. Stepp, President of World Prophetic Ministry, continues the Bible study lecture series from the book of Esther. We now join the Friday night Bible study in the King is Coming Auditorium, Colton, California, as Dr. E. Stepp is speaking from Esther chapter 4, verse 1. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Esther. We're studying chapters 4 and chapters 5 tonight, the book of Esther. We're studying about a Jewish queen in Persia, up in what is now Iraq and Iran, that part of the world. This took place in the 5th century B.C. I have a lesson outlined for you in chapter 4. It's in six parts. One, fasting and praying among the Jews, verses 1 through 3. Two, Esther disturbed because of Mordecai, verses 4 through 6. And three, Mordecai sends a message to Esther, verses 7 through 9. And then fourthly, Esther sends a message to Mordecai, verses 10 through 12. Then five, Mordecai charges Esther, verses 13 through 14. And then lastly, for chapter 4, Esther makes her decision. This is verses 15 through 17. And then in chapter 5, four little parts. One, the courage of Esther. This is chapter 5, verses 1 through 2. And two, Esther petitions the king, verses 3 through 8. And thirdly, Haman's joy knows no bounds, verses 9 through 12. And then the last part of chapter 5, Haman's plot to destroy Mordecai. Verses 13 through 14. Someone said to me, oh, this is Old Testament. This is antiquity. This is all dried up. This doesn't uh, concern us in any way. Oh, yes, it does. This will encourage us because it shows God's providential care for his people. And when I say his people, we're talking about the race of Israel. The tribes of Israel, God's providential care. And the Bible says that the eye of the Lord is upon the righteous. His ear is open under their cry, said the righteous. Not only the Jews, but the righteous. His eyes are watching, his ears are hearing. And God's mindful of all of us. God's interested in us. In 500 B.C., The Jews had come out of the Babylonian captivity. They went in the Babylonian captivity approximately 600 B.C. That's a round figure. 600 B.C. They were there 70 years and then all of them didn't go back from the Babylonian captivity back to Jerusalem. Some of them stayed in that part of the world. Esther, Mordecai, their families, they all stayed in Persia, in that part of the world. They stayed there. And so what we're reading here is a carryover or a leftover from the Babylonian cult. These are Jews. These are members of the 12 tribes. No particular particular tribe, just members of all 12 tribes. So we move into chapter 4, and we have fasting and praying among the Jews, chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, when Mordecai perceived... All that was done, Mordecai rent his clothes and put on sackcloth with ashes and went out into the midst of the city and cried with a loud and a bitter cry. Why? Well, Haman had arranged to have all the Jews put to death. Haman, the enemy or the adversary of Mordecai, had connived with the king and the king had signed a decree that all Jews should be put to death. Now remember this, Esther is Jewish. She's now married to the king. He has Uras. She's his wife, a Jewish girl married to the king. And a decree has gone out that all the Jews are going to be killed. So naturally when Mordecai heard this, it just tore him apart. He just fell apart. He came unglued as we would say today, verse 2, and came even before the king's gate, for none might enter into the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. He went to the king's gate. 
in sackcloth and ashes, and nobody's allowed to do that. But he wanted the king to know about this, verse 3, and in every province, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, there was great mourning among the Jews, and fasting, and weeping, and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. Now one can imagine the effect such a decree had done on all Israel, having the knowledge that they would be exterminated on the 13th day of the coming 12th month. Their death warrant had already been signed. They're going to be exterminated, killed, on the 13th day of the 12th month coming up. All the tribes were involved, not one tribe only, not Judah or Benjamin, but all the tribes, a remnant of the ten northern, had come back from Assyrian captivity, associated themselves with Judah and Benjamin in the south, and Judah and Benjamin in the south with a representation of the ten had been carried off into Babylonian captivity. So these are all Jews, all twelve tribes are represented. So there's fasting and praying among the Jews. It's difficult to imagine how much suffering and how much persecution and what the limitations are upon the Jews who now live behind the Iron Curtain. Some of them are forbidden. Well, practically all of them are forbidden visas to come out of uh, Russia and migrate to Israel. And some of the stronger, more powerful voices of the Jews in Russia who seem to uh, stir up the Jews behind the Iron Curtain, they're put into labor camps, put in jails and prisons, and shut up so that their voices can't be heard. And the Jews have suffered down through the ages of time. Now we move into our second part of lesson in chapter 4. Esther is disturbed because of Mordecai. See, Mordecai is out there in the first three verses of chapter 4 in front of the king's palace. He's in sackcloth and ashes. He's mindful of the fact that his people are going to be killed. We move into verses 4 through 6. So Esther's maids and her chamberlains came and told it her. She's living in the palace. She has a beautiful mansion all her own with her chambermaids and with people who are in attendant to her because she's the queen. And she doesn't know what's going on out in the streets of the city. She's locked away, as it were. So these maids and chamberlains came and told it her. Then was the queen exceedingly grieved, and she sent raiment to clothe Mordecai, because the queen knew that this wasn't right for him to be out there in the presence of the king's gate, going into the king's palace, dressed in sackcloth and ashes. This isn't the way it's done. So she sent clothing to him sent raiment to clothe Mordecai and to take away his sackcloth from him, but he received it not. He wouldn't accept it. He was determined to get his message across. Esther found out about the decree through the, her cousin's unlawful act of going before the king's gate in sackcloth and being in bitter mourning. Otherwise, she may have been so sheltered from the outside world that she might have passed the whole time away in ignorance. But Mordecai wanted this message to get around. So he goes right to headquarters in front of the king's palace. Look at verse 5. Then called Esther for Hatak, one of the king's chamberlains, whom he had appointed to attend upon her and gave him a commandment to Mordecai. Esther tells Hatak, you go to Mordecai. I want him to know what it was and why it was. So Esther is sending Hatak to Mordecai, verse 6. So Hatak went forth to Mordecai unto the street of the city, which was before the king's gate. So now we have a communication between Mordecai out at the king's gate, who is clothed in sackcloth. He's in ashes, showing humility. He's weeping bitterly. He's disturbed in his spirit, and his girl that he has raised, who is now the queen, is inside the palace. 
So she sends one of the voices inside the palace out to the gate to converse with Mordecai. Then we have Mordecai sending a message back to Esther in verses 7 through 9. And Mordecai told him, that is Hatak, told Hatak of all that had happened unto him and of the sum of the money that Haman had promised to pay to the king's treasuries for the Jews to destroy them. Also, he gave him the copy of the writing of the decree that was given a Shushan to destroy them, to show it unto Esther. Now, the queen hadn't seen the copy. She didn't know about this executive order by King Ahasuerus. She's ignorant of it. She's this beautiful woman in the Persian Empire who has uh, taken the place of Vashti, the former queen, Now the new queen, Esther, is locked up in the palace. She's a plaything of the king. She doesn't know what's going on. But Mordecai is making sure that she knows the full record of what is happening. The middle of verse 8. And to declare it unto her and to charge her that she should go in unto the king to make supplication unto him and to make request before him for her people. Up to this time, it was not known to the king that he had married a Jewess and that he had made a decree to destroy her people. He didn't know this. Haman, the villain, engineered this whole thing. Haman wanted to be the big shot. He wanted to be the secretary of state. He wanted to be the man who had the power in the kingdom. So he engineered to have Mordecai, who seemed to have favor with the queen, to have Mordecai put away. And the king didn't realize he had married a Jewess. Uh, Possibly if he had married a Jewess, if he had known she was a Jewess, he wouldn't have married her. Possibly, in all probability, he would not have. But you see, God is working this thing out. God didn't let him know he was going to marry a Jewish girl. Because God is going to use this Jewish girl later on as a wedge between the king and Haman to rescue God's people. Because God told Abraham almost 1,500 years previous to this time, God said to Abram, when he came from the Ur of the Chaldees, he said, I'm going to give you a child, which he did when Abraham was 100 years old. And then he said, I'm going to make your posterity as the stars of heaven and the sand by the seashore. And God has to make his promise absolutely positive. God can't alter it. When God promises you something, God sticks with it. And so God's not going to let the Jews all be killed in Persia because of an angry animosity spirit of a man by the name of Haman. God's going to rescue his people. He's going to redeem them. Verse 9. And Hatak came and told Esther the words of Mordecai. So... This man, Hatak, is carrying the messages back and forth. We go now to verses 10 through 12. And Esther sends a message to Mordecai. This is the second message in the same chapter. The first message was in verses 4 through 6. The second message is in verses 10 through 12. Remember, she's the queen. She's Jewish. Verse 10. Again, Esther spake unto Hatak. In other words, Esther's reply to Mordecai through her messenger was that he knew it could mean her death even to approach the king in the inner court if he had not called her and he had not called her for 30 days. Now here's the message. Verse 10. Again, Esther spake unto Hatak, gave him commandment unto Mordecai. Verse 11, all the king's servants and all the people of the king's provinces do know that whosoever, whether man or woman, shall come unto the king into the inner court. 
This is past the security guards. If you get into the inner court, who is not called? This is probably to stop the terrorist from getting in and assassinating the king. So they had a law. They had strict security. So anybody that got in the inner court, notice what it says. Except such to whom the king shall hold out the golden scepter. If you got in the inner court and you spoke to the king, the king would hold out the golden scepter and then you would touch the golden scepter and that meant then you were qualified to engage the king in conversation. They had a good security system in those days. Those boys knew that, you know, you could get a spear stuck through you without too much trouble. And they, they protected their lives. Let's pick up in the middle of verse 11 just to get our thought again. Except such to whom the king shall hold out the golden scepter that he may live. But I have not been called to come in unto the king these 30 days, Esther is saying. I haven't been invited into the king's palace, into his quarters for 30 days. Verse 12. And they told to Mordecai Esther's words. So Esther sends a message to Mordecai. She says, uh, you know, if I go in the inner court, if the king doesn't accept me, then according to the law of Persia, I can be put to death. She's being called upon to risk her life for her people. It's a tremendous message. Tre great courage for a young woman to risk her life for her people. Now we move to Mordecai charging Esther. He sends another message back to Esther, and this is in verses 13 through 14. Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther. Mordecai's answer to Esther was that it should mean her death if she did not go to the king and have this decree canceled. In other words, if she didn't go in, the decree wouldn't be canceled. If she went in and the king didn't receive her, she could be killed. So she had death staring her in the face, whether she went or whether she didn't go. Verse 13. Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, think not with thyself. In other words, don't think about your own personal security. Don't put yourself up on a pedestal and think about yourself. Think of your people. Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. Mordecai saying to her, you're a Jewish. You're a Jewish woman. If they murder all the Jews in the Persian Empire, honey, you're going to get it too. He's saying to her in so many words, verse 14, For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. What's he saying? He's saying if you don't help to deliver us, God will deliver us some other way. That's faith. One man. Mordecai, the spokesman for all of the Jewish people in the Persian Empire, having enough faith to believe that God is going to deliver his people. It says so here in verse 14. Then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth? This is one of the key verses in this whole chapter. I think this is one of the most subtle things that Mordecai said in all of his dealings with this young woman, Esther. The latter part of verse 14. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Isn't that amazing? That backs up what I've been saying over the years. God has a job for each one of us. You say, Brother Step, 
God doesn't even know I exist. Oh, yes, he does. My brother, he step, I, I don't have any talent. Yes, you do. God's got something for every one of us to do. And whether it's small or medium or large or colossal, it doesn't matter. We should all do our task. And he's saying to Esther, this young, beautiful, magnificent woman who is behind the palace gates, who has won the affection of the king of Persia, King Ahasuerus, Mordecai saying to her, God evidently has put you in as queen to help deliver us in this hour. And I believe God did. Now she has to make a decision. And it's a, it's quite a decision. Because if she goes in and the king doesn't accept her, according to Persian law, she can be put to death. If she's cold feet and doesn't have the courage to do what Mordecai is urging her to do, then all the Jews are going to be killed. And it'll be found out that she has Jewish blood in her veins and she'll be one of them. A king can always get another queen. That's no problem. They lined up banging on the front door to get in all the time. No problem there. What's she going to do? Well, she's going to make a decision, beginning in verse 15. Then Esther bade them return Mordecai this answer. She said, take him this message. Take my uncle this message. And the message, verse 16. Go, gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan, and fast ye for me, and neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. Now, she must have been a godly woman. But what she did, she called a national prayer meeting around the clock for three days and three nights. She didn't say, go out and get all the secret weapons you can and hide them in the various places in the villages and so forth. And at a given hour, we'll get her weapons and storm the palace. She didn't say that at all. She said, we're going to have a three day and three night prayer meeting. Jewish woman, the queen in the palace, middle of verse 16. I also and my maidens will fast likewise. The queen and her maidens inside the palace, they're going to be involved in the prayer meeting. And so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. Isn't that beautiful? If I die, I die. Dedication. Sold out for God. And when you get that kind of dedication, you get something done. You can never do a job for God with people who are wishy-washy and people who are not dedicated and people who are criticizing and people who are finding faults. You can't do anything for God with that kind of a crowd. You have to have people who put their life on the line for God. She says, if I die, I die. If I perish, I perish. Verse 17. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther had commanded him. Mordecai went to get the Jews to fast and pray in cooperation with Esther and her maidens in such affliction that they might prove the God of heaven to touch the heart of the king to spare Esther and her people. Evidently, that's what was in the mind of Mordecai. That was in the mind of Esther. God touched the heart of my husband. Touched the heart of this king. You know, God, I'm not Persian. I'm Jewish. And evidently, God, you have called me into this position and placed me in this place that I can be an instrument 
of deliverance for my people at this time. It's amazing. If you have the power to do something for God, do it. God will use it for his honor and his glory, and God will bless you. And you'll get joy and happiness out of it. And your eyes will sparkle and your step will have spring in it. And you'll be pleasant and easygoing and happy-go-lucky, easy to get along with when you're in the will of God. This is a valley. But they're going to come out and go up the mountaintop. You watch. They're going to have a mountain peak. So she made her decision. She said, I'll go into the king. I'll just walk right in. I'll tell him right off what the whole thing's all about. We move into verse, in ch- we move into chapter five and we have first of all the courage of Esther. This is verses one through two, chapter five. Remember, this is a young woman. She's not an old lady. She hasn't had all of the experience of life. It's true when we get into trouble sometimes, we go to the older people because they've traveled down the highway of life and they have experienced the pitfalls and the persecutions and the misunderstandings and all of the ramifications that come down the highway of life. And sometimes you can get comforting words from an older person. But this is a young woman. She's very young. Verses 1 through 2 of chapter 5, the courage of Esther. Now it came to pass on the third day. This is the prayer meeting's been going on for three days. Among all the Jews, Mordecai went out through the kingdom and he sent messengers and couriers and so forth. And he got every Jew that he could find and he passed the word, pray, pray, pray for three days and three nights. The queen is in the palace and she's praying. Now it came to pass on the third day that Esther put on her royal apparel. She's going to knock his eyeballs out with her beauty. Ah, the intelligence of a woman. Men, we don't, we just can't measure up to them. She knows how to get the right kind of clothes with the right beautiful dyes in the cloth and put on the right thing and the hair the right way and and the flower in the hair and perfume. They're noted for their perfumes over there. And she says, I'll go into the old boy and I'll see what I can do with it. (laughs) They were just human beings. No different. Oh, they had a different position in life, king and queen, but so what? That Esther put on her royal apparel and stood in the inner court of the king's house. She dressed in her very best and the very flashiest and the one that would get her the most attention. And she probably had had the king comment on it one time before. And he said, darling, you are absolutely stunning in that outfit. Maybe he did. I don't know. If he didn't, he's a dumbbell. (laughs) So she put it on, went into the inner court of the king's house, over against the king's house, and the king sat up on his royal throne in the royal house, looking out through the big sliding glass doors. If they had sliding glass doors in those days. Anyhow, he's looking out into the courtyard. He's kind of nosy. He's watching everything going on. Over against the gate of the house, verse 2. And it was so when the king saw Esther. Aha! When the king saw Esther, the queen standing in the court, that she obtained favor in his sight. And he must have said, boy, she's beautiful. And the king held out to Esther the golden scepter. That was in his hand. So Esther drew near and touched the top of the scepter. So she passed one of the hurdles already. She's inside. She's not going to be put to death. She got through the security. She went through the electronic system to find out if she had any guns or 
knives or can openers on her. Isn't it rather funny and rather stupid the way they search you at the airport? They run you through an electronic thing. I even have to take my watch off. I take out my nail file. I take out my pocket knife. I take out a little thing I carry coins in and I have to put it in a little container so I can go through the electronic device and... uh before I can get through into the area where I board the plane. And then as soon as we all get on the plane, what do they do? They give all of us knives and forks. <laughs> you ever notice that? Knives and forks. Why, you've got enough artillery to kill each other. <laughs> she got past the security. We move into verses 3 through 8. And she's going to lay the whole thing before the king. She's going to tell him the whole story. This is verses 3 through 8. And in verse 3, Then said the king unto her, What wilt thou, Queen Esther? He's giving her that love talk. Dear, you should, you know, let's go shopping. Are you, you know that dress you've been wanting? Let's go down and get it tonight. It's Friday night. We're not going to the Bible class. We'll just go down shopping tonight. (laughs) What wilt thou, Queen Esther? And what is thy request? It shall be even given thee to the half of the kingdom. Why, he says in so many words, you beautiful darling, I'll give you, I'll give you anything you want. Even half of the kingdom is yours if you want it. That guy's got plans for the future. He's really making up to her. Verse 4, and Esther answered, If it seemed good unto the king, she's got to be a diplomat now. She can't just rush into this thing. If it seemed good unto the king, let the king and Haman. She hadn't said a word about Mordecai. Haman. Oh, he's the villain. He's the fly in the ointment. He's the guy that engineered this whole thing. Look at the mind of this woman. Brains. Woo. If it seem good unto the king, let the king and Haman come this day unto the banquet that I have prepared for him. We're going to have a little tea over at my house. How about king bringing Haman along? Just we three. We'll just sit down and Nice little afternoon meal. I'll throw some steaks on the barbecue and mix up some potato salad. Peel the pineapple. We'll just have a nice little, just we three. Smart, smart girl. Very smart. Verse 5. Then the king said, cause Haman to make haste. He fell for it. Right off he said, get Haman. Get him over here, quick. Cause Haman to make haste that he may do as Esther hath said. So the king and Haman came to the banquet that Esther had prepared. Double smart. She didn't spill the cart here. She never told her secret at the first banquet. She kind of failed them out. She led them into conversation and found how they were feeling and they dropped a few little hints here and there and she got the picture. So what's she going to do? She's going to have another banquet. She can't do it all at the one time, so she's going to have another one. And you'll notice this. And the king in verse 6 said unto Esther at the banquet of wine... What is thy petition? What is it, dear? Sweetie pie. What is it? And it shall be granted thee. And what is thy request? Even to the half of the kingdom it shall be performed. Then answered Esther and said, My petition and my request is this. She's kind of demure and Fragile and, you know, needs help. 
big strong man wants to go over and help her, you know, she's very fragile. If I have found favor, verse 8, in the sight of the king, and if it please the king to grant my petition and to perform my requests, let the king and Haman come to another banquet. Didn't say another. I stuck that in, but it's a second banquet. Let Haman, the king and Haman, come to the banquet that I shall prepare for them. And I will do tomorrow as the king has said. Tomorrow I will tell you. She holds them. She holds them in. She holds them in suspense. Very few women just come right out and tell we men everything all at once. Oh, no, they just give you a little tiny bit, like fishing. You never throw all the worms in the creek at one time to catch fish. You won't have any fishing if you do. You just give one little worm at a time. So she just feeds them along, a little bit at a time. She says, now, if you'll come to the second banquet, I will tell you at that banquet what my petition is. Well... The king still doesn't know that she's Jewish. He must be a dummy. You could almost look at her and tell that. So he wondered, now what is this gal up to? We've had one banquet, now she wants to have another one. And she says at the second banquet, she's going to tell me what her petition is. I imagine by this time he thought, well, maybe she'll go home to her mother. <laughs> But not the case. Absolutely not. We're going to see something here. Haman's joy knows no bound. What she did, she poured a little gasoline on the momentum of of Haman. Oh, he's egotistical. He wants to be the big shot. He wants to be the secretary of state. He wants to be in charge. So what's going to happen? Notice. Notice how the ego comes out in this man Haman in verse 9 through 12. Verse 9. Then when Haman forth that day joyful and with a glad heart. Of course, she fed him some wine too, you know. He didn't go on Pepsi that way. She got him some wine that day, joyful and with a glad heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate... Mordecai still sitting in the gate in those crummy looking clothes, in the dust and the ashes, sackcloth. Oh, he was, a, he was a terrific character. He didn't move very easily. Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate that he stood not up nor moved for him. He was full of indignation against Mordecai. Haman had just come from the Oval Office. He just come from the blue room. He just had lunch with the president and the first lady. And he is some pumpkin. <laughs> and this stinker Mordecai, there he is. He doesn't get up and pay respect to it. Boy, is he mad at Mordecai. Notice what it says in verse 10. Nevertheless, Haman refrained himself. He kind of held himself. And when he came home, he sent and called for his friends and Zerash his wife. This reveals the smallness of Haman's character and demonstrates his pride and his narrowness. He called his friends and his wife so that he could pour out to them his one small complaint and brag on the success that he had accomplished in the Persian Empire by being a personal friend of the king. He called his wife Zeresh and his friends, verse 11. And Haman told them of the glory of his riches. You can tell he was a fool. No man goes around bragging about his riches. But this stinker, notice what it says. And Haman told them of the glory of his riches and the multitude of his children. This is the followers, who people who are interested, who are paying him homage. 
and all the things wherein the king had promoted him, and how he had advanced him above the princes and the servants of the king. He said, listen here, fellas. There ain't been nobody in the kingdom that has gone to the top as fast as I have. I want you to take note of that. I'm smart. Telling his wife that. I don't think she believed it. But that's neither here nor there. Verse 12. Haman said, moreover, Yea, Esther the queen did let no man come in with the king unto the banquet that she had prepared but herself, and tomorrow am I invited unto her also with the king. Tomorrow I'm going back to the palace. And the queen and the king and I, we three are going to sit down and have lunch together. Egotistical. Sad, sad situation. There's an old saying, I don't hear it much anymore. Let a fool have enough rope and he'll hang himself. We're going to see that come to pass in the story here. Haman's plot to destroy Mordecai is revealed in verses 13 through 14. Yet all this availeth me nothing. He's saying, I've got all this wealth. I got this popularity. I come and go through the security guards getting into the palace. I just show my button and I go on in. Nobody stops me. I got free access to the Oval Office. I have my own press conference. The reporters are there. Big shots, you know. Yet all this availeth me nothing so long as I see Mordecai, the Jew, sitting at the king's gate. This one Jew, Mordecai, was a thorn in the flesh for Haman. He resented it, hated it. Verse 14. Then said Zerash, his wife, and all his friends unto him. I'm surprised that the wife thought of this. I would have thought Haman would have thought of it, but it was the wife. The wife and all his friends led a gallus be made of 50 cubits high, and tomorrow, when you go to the second banquet, tomorrow speak thou unto the king that Mordecai may be hanged thereon. Why don't you tomorrow, when you're with the queen and the king, and you're having this very exclusive luncheon, why don't you just suggest to the king, why don't we hang this Jew? He'll go along with you. Just suggest it. Because he wants to get rid of them anyhow. You're going to put several thousand shekels of silver and gold and so forth in the treasury. You've already promised that. Whatever you suggest, Haman, the king will go for it. Just suggest tomorrow. Let's get rid of this Jew. He's causing all of the problems. Isn't that just like today? The whole Arab world is saying, let's get rid of the Jews. We want Jerusalem back. Let's, let's get rid of them. Let's annihilate them. Let's push them into the Mediterranean. Let's stop all oil sales to them. Let's cut off all commerce to them. Let's bottle them up there in that little piece of real estate on the shores of the Mediterranean and let's just starve them to death. Same thing. 2,400 years later. Almost 2,500 years later. Same thing happening all over to the whole Jewish race again. Let a gallus be made of fifty cubits high, and tomorrow speak thou unto the king that Mordecai may be hanged thereon. Then go thou in merrily with the king unto the banquet. And the thing pleased Haman, and he caused the gallus to be made. Now he had power. He had authority. Because he just issued a decree and he said, build a gallus. 
Some say it was a pole that they strung him up on. The kind that we are familiar with in the old days of the West and so forth was a scaffold that they walked up 13 steps and then they plunged through a trap door. It wasn't that kind. The historians say it was a tall pole and what they did, they just tied a rope around their neck and they pulled him up high enough so that they would strangle to death so their feet couldn't touch the ground. Didn't take too long to erect it. He's going to get rid of him. And in all of this, God's hand of preservation, God's going to preserve the Jews. He's got a lovely little Jewish woman over there as the queen. He's got Mordecai sitting out here in sackcloth and ashes at the king's gate having a press conference all the time. People are coming by and they're saying, man, how come you're doing this? And everybody comes by and Mordecai tells them. And this is spreading all over the kingdom. And there's a big furor uh, in the kingdom. The Jews are having prayer. The Jews are concerned. The king is being subjected to the beauty of his queen and she's conniving and working, evidently led of the Holy Spirit to bring this thing to fruition so the Jewish people will be saved. The gallus of Haman couldn't hang him. The fires of Nebuchadnezzar's furnace couldn't burn him. And the Red Sea couldn't drown them. They are an indestructible race of people. No one has yet been able to exterminate them because they are God's chosen people from the loins of Abraham when he was a hundred years old and Sarah was 90. And God used that race of people to bring Jesus Christ, the man, on the world scene. Born of the virgin woman from the tribe of Judah in the little town of Bethlehem, four miles outside of Jerusalem. You see, God is over and above every circumstance. God knows every one of our secrets. God knows every one of our pains, every one of our heartaches. God knows the successes that we have in our own lives, in our individual lives. God knows the intent of all of our hearts. Nothing is secret. So he's not going to let a pagan king exterminate the seed of Abraham. Because if God did, God would be a liar. God is not a liar. You have heard Dr. Estep deliver the third Bible study lecture from the book of Esther, chapter 4 through chapter 5, verse 14. This Bible study lecture series continues on the other side of the cassette tape.